And welcome to a grade A mutt edition of Archive Thrifting, out of sheer necessity. So anyway, over the last few years, I've been known to lament that thrifting in general has just gone downhill. But one thing has remained constant, and that is that the first few months out of the year are always the worst. There's kind of a reason it's very rare for me to put out a thrifting episode in, say, March. So anyway, uh, normally when spring hits, you know, people are doing spring cleaning, things start to pick up, but it just didn't happen this year. So I've got, admittedly, a total Frankenstein's monster of a thrifting episode for you here. I got three segments for you here, presented in effectively chronological order, but even that's a, a little quirky. So the first segment was actually shot early last December for use either in the Christmas thrifting episode, even though there was no Christmas stuff at that store at that moment, or the kind of second one I pulled off right around New Year's, but I just didn't need the footage. I just kind of had a, a good spurt there going for a while. The second segment is actually stitched together out of two visits to the same store, two and a half months apart. So parts of it I'm wearing a coat, and other parts I'm just in my short sleeves. Either that or there was some sort of very sudden heat wave. Anyway, uh, then the third and final segment is the only kind of truly Archivian summer thrifting segment I have for you so far this year. And that was actually shot on Memorial Day, so the uh, unofficial start of summer. But anyway, if you've watched me do these things long enough, you know that these things just don't come easy all too often. And this is a prime example of that. But uh, let's get down to business here. Starting way back on a cold gray day at a cold gray Goodwill. Let's see if there's any warm deals inside. In the record section, a copy of Lori Anderson's avant-garde pop hybrid classic, Big Science, from 1982, which I totally would have grabbed had it not been... partially devoured. Otherwise, it was mostly the usual junk, except for... Tom Lehrer's first album, an original 10-inch copy no less. I've already got this one, same issue, and in damn near perfect condition. I'll leave it for someone else, uh, you know, a little thrift store karma. Anyway, I, I found one of those so-called stereo test records, which is just a compilation of existing easy listening stuff. Well, this is depressing. I'm gonna guess someone was a caretaker for someone with dementia, and the patient either had to go to the nursing home or died before they could get this installed. Merry Christmas! Three stray eight tracks, one of which is pretty notorious on vinyl. 90 Minutes with Arthur Fiedler and the Boston Pops. Notorious because it's the longest album, as far as I know, to ever be crammed onto a single disc. All the fun kind of goes out of it on 8-track. Otherwise, a stray, rather dull Christmas cassette. Kenny Rogers' The Gambler album, which I already have on CD. Pat Benatar's Get Nervous, from 1982, which is easily one of her better records, <laughs> cover notwithstanding. Uh, though I generally consider her to be one of those eternally frustrating, half-a-good-record kind of artists. Aside from that, uh, this was a bit baffling, Superstar by the Carpenters, which, as it turns out, is the Korean issue and title of their self-titled album. Behind that, I found a copy of Bob Seger's Against the Wind, which I already have on CD twice, now, these Seeger tapes usually sound really good, so I figured I'd give it a shot and see how it stacks up to my other Seeger tapes, and uh, as it turns out, quite well. But uh, anyway, moving on to the CDs, Berlin's first and best album, which I already have that issue of that CD. 
And this seemed so overwhelmingly early 90s. The Guys Next Door and the CD single for I Was Made For You. Can't say I'd ever heard of the group or song. I was getting some serious Color Me Bad vibes from this thing. Also, I haven't seen an SBK Records release in years now. Well, I was in the market for a new GPS at the time. The one I took to do the AM stereo thing last year was so outdated it thought I was driving in an open field half the time. I just wound up buying a new one. And, uh, oh yeah, breast pump. And the meager haul from this store consisted of two cassettes, one from Bob Seeger and one from Pat Benatar, which amusingly was from when some labels were trying to curb the whole tape copying thing with a certificate of authenticity, which you could register with the label. By the way, the tape had gone sticky. I was totally ready to blast Shadows of the Night, and instead the tape took a massive dump on the heads of my best deck. And on we go to my awkwardly spliced together trips, plural, to savers. And no, that's not a time lapse. The clouds really were moving that fast that day. At first, I thought this couldn't be a Billy Connolly alarm clock. Turns out that's exactly what it is. My second thought was there's a second person in South Dakota that knows who Billy Connolly is? Anyway, I had to fight the temptation to pick this one up, just to see how Connolly, or some impersonator thereof, would wake me every morning. If I know his stand-up well enough, I'm gonna assume he calls me a c**t for 30 seconds at a shot. In the CDs, a copy of ABBA's final album, The Visitors, from 1982. Everything seems to be from 82 today. The case is totally trashed, but the CD is freaking pristine. Now, weirdly enough, I've got most of ABBA's albums on CD and almost entirely from thrift store bins. And as an added bonus, this is one of those super early West German-made discs. And I believe this is one of those precious few first pop albums to get released on CD in 1982. Damn right I'm picking it up. Anyway, rip-off alert... A would-be tempting oldies compilation from Madison. These things are usually one or two original recordings, and the rest all original artist re-recordings. This one doesn't even have one original recording. Now, conversely, this one looks like a knockoff, but it's not. Realm Records was a perfectly legit reissue label, just with a penchant for cheesy packaging. Judy Collins's Wildflowers. I've been seeing this for years on vinyl, and a viewer recently sent me a cassette, uh, which alas had turned to goo. Eh, I guess I'll give it a shot. Anyway, uh, one of the many, many orchestral Beatles records, all of which make me equally drowsy. Yeah, I think I'm going to keep holding out for more individual America albums. This Greatest Hits has some questionable edits and remixes on it. Anyway, on to the cassettes. I found me a record ripoffs candidate that I already kind of have, as it turns out. I know I've got at least one CD from the so-called Beat Street Band, but I didn't remember the individual songs at the time, and at 99 cents I figured, what the hell. Tiny little 8-track selection. Well, this'll be the third copy of Yes's Fragile album that I've picked up on these thrifting videos. Alas, no artwork. But at least it's one of those tapes without the foam, and is easily opened and repaired. Otherwise, don't let the title fool you. The Worst of Jefferson Airplane is actually a very good summary of their first six albums. And no edits, no censorship, no garbage. Not that Surrealistic Pillow and Volunteers aren't well worth hearing in their entirety. 
I wish I could say the same for this Soul Gold Volume 1 tape. Another Gusto special, and this time from fourth tier or lower artists. No hits. In the VHS section, a pretty early MGM tape, a copy of Newt Rockney, All-American, featuring some ugly dude that eventually became president or something. Anyway, I've owned way too many of these cheapy, public domain, Three Stooges compilations, one of those ones that could have easily fit on one tape, no less. And uh, another bit of quasi-nostalgia. I encountered this very, very similar Charlie Chaplin compilation at Media Play and Suncoast Video eh, about a million times in the late 90s and early 2000s. I wound up going with the two Mammoth Madison 10 tape apiece sets circa 2000. Getting back to the Three Stooges, I knew there was an NES game, but not a PC game, and certainly not this late. This looks so cheap and so awful, I'm kind of regretting not picking it up. Not that anyone would ever want to see me try and play this thing. I cherry-picked a few 45s to look at. Most amusing was a rendition of Bobby Hebb's classic Sunny, as performed by Moms Mabley. Behind that, a true archive classic, which is backed by an even bigger archive classic. Send for Siege. Anyway, Hams, the beer refreshing, apparently made a record at some point, and uh, yeah, of course I picked it up. Otherwise, uh, talk about a record I never cared much for. And uh, one of James Brown's Christmas singles. Behind that, uh, dare I admit, I've never been much of a Kiss fan. I'm just kind of indifferent. Jackson Brown. You know, it always irks me when I hear just stay on the oldies station. Here it's a double insult. The loadout is on one side and stay on the other. But behind that, we got a legit classic from Buffalo Springfield, which unfortunately looks like it was used to chop vegetables at some point. In the electronics, I got my hopes up for about a split second. I thought I might have finally found a month's four-track player, albeit for a car. Nope, it's just a basic eight-track deck for your car. Also found a loose cassette, if you will, of the St. Elmo's Fire soundtrack. And I admit, I unironically love John Parr's tune on that thing. But I guess the reason I saw that tape there was a TIAC dual cassette deck, a brand I normally don't see in the South Dakota thrift stores. Looks like a decent enough deck, but I've got a feeling it didn't react well to that St. Elmo's fire tape. Anyway, this totally doesn't look enabling to an alcoholic. Russian roulette. And I guess the toy keyboard next to it somehow ties in. I didn't have any way of testing it, so I passed. Passed on the keyboard, that is. Do you feel paranoid? Are you convinced someone's spying on you? Well, worry no more. It's the Mole Eliminator. Decapitate those pesky moles and operate your shady little business in peace. Order today! Or it's to capture actual moles. And the combined haul from this store consists of two 8-tracks, Yes's Fragile, and The Worst of Jefferson Airplane. We've got one knockoff audio cassette, Movie Hits Volume 2, by the Beat Street Band. Found off-camera, I found two 45s, both record ripoffs candidates, renditions of You Don't Have to Be a Baby to Cry, and Blame It on the Bossa Nova. Then two more 45s. Hey America, It's Christmas, by James Brown, and, of course, the Ham's Music to Drink Beer by Disc. I also grabbed four CDs, themes from The Lion King and other movie hits, of course for the record ripoff's candidate pile, John Fogarty's Centerfield, replacing a scratched-up CD, Judy Collins' Wildflowers, and ABBA's The Visitors.
And on to today's last store, 605 Antiques. Had kind of a bad experience here last time, but uh, let's give him a shot at redemption. Mixed in with the photography were a few LPs, and uh, mostly some real dogs, but one stood out like a sore thumb. Procol Harem's Grand Hotel. Already have this on CD, and an early Japanese one at that. Damn near picked this up, but I managed to hold back. Five bucks. I mean, it's in nice shape and all, but this is a rather spotty album. But it does have its moments. I love the title cut. Lot of VHS today. And of course, I think I'm obligated to check out anything from Branson. Making tracks to Branson, which looks atrocious. But what really caught my attention was the music credit. Jimmy Rogers. Nice of Jimmy to rise from the grave some 60 years after his death to score some wonky Branson video. Or it's the honeycomb and kisses sweeter than wine guy. Well, here's one from the deceptive advertising department. Movie Struck, allegedly starring Laurel and Hardy. They only make a cameo here. Of course, those of us of a certain age will remember those cheapy Little Shop of Horrors tapes that claimed it starred Jack Nicholson when he's in it for like two minutes. Well, if the Found Footage Fest guys ever make another book of VHS covers, here's a candidate. Beepers, Tweeters, and Peckers, which alas is not a documentary about pimps. And speaking of Found Footage Fest, here's a classic from their stage show, Magic Star Traveler, featuring some of the most gloriously awful video effects ever seen publicly. Now, I damn near picked this up, but it's got the wrong tape in it. I saw the TV commercial for this a ton of times growing up, and I still haven't seen the main program. So generally, when something like this happens, I just go looking for the sleeve to the misplaced tape, and I found it. And it had a copy of Action Jackson in it. Alas, no copies of Action Jackson were around to check. Mixed in with the video games were two stray laser discs, both Pink Floyd. I've already got Live at Pompeii, and I love it, and it's a classic, but I don't have Delicate Sound of Thunder. I mean, I've had the album forever, but not the video. It's pretty dirty, it's got a few superficial scratches, and at ten bucks we're just below Fleabay pricing, but uh, yeah, I think I can clean this up. Not sure why I would, it's my least favorite Floyd release, but... Uh, I guess I'm just a completist. Well, this movie camera totally crushed the box of another, more promising-looking movie camera. This Kodak Ektasound Super 8 camera, which, as implied, does do sound, but they don't make or process sound Super 8 film anymore. If they did, I'd totally be picking it up. Here we have a Rittenhouse CM1 intercom, probably from the 1950s. Today, we're going to try and resurrect this beauty using the roach crap as a power source. This thing just needs some TLC. In the board games, I found a true bit of nostalgia. Knockout, from 1992. I had this as a kid and I sold it at a garage sale years later. I'll let the commercial fill you in on this one. You think you can knock out these bricks? No problem! Without making the wall fall? Let's rock and roll! Grab a hammer, knock out those bricks! But you gotta be careful, you gotta be slick! Don't let the wall fall, that's what it's about! Knock out! It'll knock you out! This was a fun game, but I just don't feel like paying 25 bucks for the nostalgia, and the thing might not even work, I didn't have any way of testing it. But anyway, another bit of nostalgia. I had a much later issue of this thing. Come to think of it, I really liked those messy games as a kid. I also loved Mousetrap and The Grape Escape for what it's worth. You know, anything my dad could trip and break his neck on. Well, in this uh, horribly cluttered section, I found a VHS-DVD combo unit. 
Now, as some of these had component and or HDMI outputs, unfortunately, the ones that could output, you know, the VHS side of things via component or HDMI are stupidly rare. The hunt continues. My office chair is very much falling apart on me, so I am kind of in the market for a replacement. This clear one would certainly fit the obsolete aesthetic of the archive, but my desk sits too low to accept any chair with arms. Anyway, paging classical gas emissions Ben, I found you an 8-track of the first Blue Oyster Cult album, which I'm pretty sure you've already got and in much better shape and probably not a record club issue. Actually, most of the tapes in this section appear to be record club issues. Way back in a dark corner of the store, are you freaking kidding me? A shock therapy machine. This shouldn't be in an antique store. This should be in a museum. A museum all about what not to do in medicine. And the worst part is they want 350 bucks for this thing and they don't even throw in the headbands? Well, how am I supposed to test it? Well, here we go further reinforcing my recurring statement that it's perpetual Halloween in archive land. Part of me wonders if I shouldn't use a frame from this as the thumbnail for the Halloween thrifting video later this year. You know, just to mess with everyone. Well, if this doesn't say South Dakota, I don't know what does. The ripped-off skull of a deer sitting on top of a little beer fridge. And the haul from this store consists of the Pink Floyd Delicate Sound of Thunder laser disc, recorded at the end of a long tour, and uh, lord does it sound like it. Found off camera, I found a cassette copy of the Dwight Twilly Band's first album at $1, and being the only copy I've ever seen of that on cassette, uh, yeah, I gave it a shot. I found three VHS tapes, putting on the glitz, about the Orpheum Theater down in Sioux City, making tracks to Branson, featuring Eddie Rabbit, uh, with only one T, budget cuts, and Magic Star Traveler. And the final haul for this episode consists of two 8-tracks from Yes and Jefferson Airplane, four audio cassettes, one record ripoffs candidate, and three more general pop rock tapes. Alas, the Pat Benatar tape has gone sticky, and the Dwight Twilly tape needs a new pressure pad. We've got four 45s, Hey America, It's Christmas, from James Brown, Ham's Beer, Music to Drink Beer By, and two from sh I mean hit records, both record ripoffs candidates. Then we have four CDs from ABBA, Judy Collins, John Fogarty, and themes from The Lion King and other movie hits for the record ripoffs pile. Then we've got three VHS tapes, putting on the glitz, making tracks to Branson, and Magic Star Traveler. And last but not least, the Pink Floyd laser disc, which cleaned up beautifully and plays perfectly. Sleeves a bit worn, though. Anyway, the cost of this haul came out to about $37. And that's it for this installment of Archive Thrifting. I'll talk to you again soon. Branson Lakes Area Chamber of Commerce, how can I help you? Yeah, I'm Harold Dog. Me and my wife Precious want to come to Branson. What do I say? Tell them it's our fourth anniversary, Harold. And <laughs> you say your name's Precious and Harold Dog? <laughs> okay. Oh, well. Oh, look, Harold, they sure have a lot of nice restaurants here. I wonder if they've got any hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs>